Mike Dalma is an assistant research professor at Georgetown University and the director of the Georgetown Institute for the Study of Markets and Ethics. His research background is in American and Dutch history, slavery, capitalism, and historical methods. Ostensibly, most of his time is either spent chopping wood or publishing new books, among which is the subject of discussion today. What is classical liberal history? Dalma's co-editor on this project is Phil Magnus, a professor at Barry College's Campbell School of Business and author of Colonization After Emancipation, Lincoln and the Movement for Black Resettlement. Welcome to Liberty Chronicles, a project of libertarianism.org. I'm Anthony Comegna. Okay, so let's start with Mike Dalma. Uh, can you give us your 30-second elevator pitch for this book? Go ahead and answer the title question. What is classical liberal history? Um, in my mind, the main line of history is this historicist, empiricist type history that developed in the early 19th century. And I think it's no coincidence that liberalism developed in the 19th century at the same time that professional history developed, that we began questioning based, basic assumptions, began looking at the sources, et cetera, et cetera. And so for, for me, classical liberal history, what I really, we've coined this term, I want to define it as the main line, the forgotten main line, the idea that we can go to the sources, rigorously debate them, and come up with some sort of truth. In addition to that, it's the idea that what matters and what we should be talking about is liberty. And liberty was a motivating, animating concern of 19th century historians. Okay. And Phil, could you do the same thing? Give us your 30-second version of what is classical liberal history. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, basically the purpose behind this book and why we brought uh, these authors together um, is to carve out uh, the niche in the field that, uh, that Michael described. Uh, we basically noticed the trajectory of the history discipline, um, although it's always kind of had uh, some notice, the classical liberal scholars on the periphery um, is very much moving in other, other different uh, directions uh, from what um, our tradition tends to contribute. So we were hoping to fill that niche and bring material from a classical liberal perspective uh, directly to bear and say, hey, we can look at issues uh, slightly differently than some um, other scholars have done, and there are new insights to draw out of that. So what are what are some of these issues that you think classical liberal history brings to the table or some of the new methods perhaps that we have to offer, some of the insights that we can contribute to the historical discipline more broadly? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the one that I keep stressing and it draws uh, pretty closely out of my own work, so I, I do have a bias toward it, but uh, uh, the insights of the economic way of thinking, this is something that uh, – uh, historically, in the mid-20th century, there was a bit of a split between economic historians and then uh, regular historians that studied social events, and they really haven't talked to each other too much uh, in the time since then. What it's created is kind of a rift in methodology to where uh, you have uh, economists that are very good at numbers, very good at um, empirical insights, but also the theory behind it, but they aren't talking to the historians. And I see classical liberals do tend to come out of a, um, a firmer economic footing. So that uh, that's something that does carry forward uh, more in our, our work than uh, some of the other uh, areas and traditions of the history discipline. I would say to me, the key of classical liberal history is the tradition of openness and debate and source criticism. And I feel like a lot of times in the 20, late 20th century with the rise of social history, Marxist history, postmodernism, we place theory before evidence. And so we lose that original historicist claim that we go to the sources to discover our history. And we've learned important things from those other schools of history. But sometimes I think the pendulum has been swung too far that we're beginning with our theories and ideologies and going back to try to, to serve those. Can you explain that term historicist to us and perhaps give us a background on the origins of classical liberal history as you know, a method or approach? 
Sure, I do my best. But historicism, it's one of these words that I would say most graduate students don't learn or don't learn properly. It's a very, it's a very confusing word. And in fact, the best book on this is Friedrich Beiser, and he's a, a historian, a, philo- a historian of philosophy, and he writes about the German idealist tradition. He's got five or six books on these topics, and he's got a book about the German historicist tradition, which is really good. Essentially, historicism is the idea that the past was different from the present, that things change over time, and that to understand a period, we have to go to that period. Now, the term historicism develops in the 19th century in Germany. It's historismus, and sometimes it gets translated into English as historism, and there's some complications. But it essentially means that we're going against this old natural law tendency that things are universal, and that, that morals, ideas, even economics are somehow always the same. And so the historicists on the extreme end might even um, challenge things like logic. They might say logic is different at different times and places. Mm. Germans Econo- have a different logic than Frenchmen. Yeah, right? yeah. Just to be aware of the situation in which you're interpreting the history. Now, why this term gets complicated, I blame Karl Popper with his poverty of historicism in, was it 1950? seven or 59 or something, where he uses the term in a totally different way. He means deriving ultimate theories of teleological history that explain everything from those sources, right? Where the original historicists in Germany were the tradition that I'm talking about here. They were uh, individualists and and, and liberals who um, fought against these, these totalizing tendencies of history. They didn't say there was one history, right? And so... Karl Popper switch, flips this term around, and that's how it's often known in the English language as historicists are people that create universalist theories of history. So again, you're, part of what you want to argue is that classical liberal history really used to be just history, period. It was generally the way people practiced it was with a, a classical liberal set of methods uh, that they were working with. Um, could you tell us a bit about that? What are the what are the particular tools that a classical liberal historian brings to the table? Yeah. So one of them, another complicated term, I think, if we're going to introduce historicism, is hermeneutics, which is just different ways of textual analysis and interpretation. And this this term, once again, has many different definitions and can be quite complicated. But essentially, by hermeneutics, what I mean is um, comparing sources to understand terms and words as they were used in the period, right? And that if you spend ten years reading, as I have, for example, Dutch diplomatic papers from the 1860s, you start to see that a word that they used then isn't the same as the word used today, right? So it's the contextual understanding of words and and sort of figuring out what the meanings are so that you avoid these these mistakes, right? And um, it's I think through that is the recognition of things like these these concepts that we have, that they're invented, right? So a term can change meaning at different times. And and we look at something like, say, Marxism in class. Well, is what they're talking about class in the 19th century the same as today, right? Classes are constantly changing. The concept of what we mean is different. And so the classical liberal historian wants to go to the basics, wants to start with individuals and their own actions and understand how were they thinking about the world? What were their motivating factors? Not look at the larger concepts of things like class and state and nationhood because these concepts change over time and 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 don't act, as we say. Now, I want to jump back to Phil because uh, in our last episode, I interviewed David M. Hart at uh, the Online Library for Liberty and Liberty Fund. And as I'm sure you know, David Hart has made his career basically in trying to revive the concept of class and put it back in focus, uh, perhaps in the center of libertarian thinking about the past. But I notice it's conspicuously absent from your book. So I want to ask you, why did you not put any chapters in there on libertarians in class? Is, is there something that you'd like to avoid in talking about class? I wouldn't say it's so much avoiding it. I think it's more uh, space limitations, obviously, are uh, a concern with publishing any uh, any type of book of this nature. Uh, so we did cast our net broadly in trying to hit uh, a number of different themes. 
Uh, I would say that there are elements of, uh, of class theory that are implicit in some of our discussions that we get into, especially uh, on the economic end, although it is um, a type of class theory that diverges from uh, what we consider the mainstream history profession, which uh, uh, for better or for worse, I'd argue for worse, um, has moved in kind of the Marxist definition uh, that, teach, uh, that treats classes as collective entities, uh, collective actors. Uh, my own take on it is that there is some value to talk about social status um, as a historical term, particularly as people see themselves in their own social status. Uh, but I also tend to approach it from an angle uh, that uses economic theory. Uh, one of those theories that I draw on very heavily in my own work uh, is Mansur Olson's uh, Logic of Collective Action. And he presents a very um, a robust critique of the notion that class identity is a, uh, a massive motivating factor for human action. Uh, rather, he's arguing that there are other uh, tendencies that arise to the top. Uh, some of them are self-interested, but, uh, but basically it's a critique of this, uh, uh, this Marxian approach that treats class as a dominant actor in history onto itself. It says basically individuals respond to individual incentives, and those incentives don't always align with class action. Uh, that we'd see uh, as a historical event as well as uh, uh, in the modern sense. So, uh, well, I wouldn't say that I have any um, aversion to it. In fact, uh, quite a bit of David's work is, uh, has been very useful and informative uh, for my own and for many of the other scholars that contributed to the volume. Um, it's, it, it's something that kind of fell to the background of other themes that we did explore in the book. So, it, yeah, reading it, it seemed to me that your problem would not be so much with the idea of social classes or especially political classes developing, um, but more with the lazy historians who would just say, oh, class is the explanatory factor here. Clearly, class is what's motivating people's decisions all the time. That way, we don't have to do much deeper work doing exactly what Mike was talking about, getting into the, the details of, you know, years and years and years of your life reading these things and really getting down to it and understanding these people. Well, I think we have to thank the Marxists for bringing class into the discussion. It's an important factor. It's an important concept. But to call it the one and only explanation for historical change, as Marx seems to, does, seems to do, is pushing a little bit f too far. And this is why I sometimes think of Marxist history as sort of like the young earth creationist version <laughs> of history, where... Uh, you know, at some point, material determinism, does this work? Can we jettison that? Okay, what about stage theories? Well, let's jettison that. Labor theory doesn't seem to work, right? And after a while, I wonder what is left of Marxist history. And what's left of it is usually underperforming cranky historians in marginalized positions. But the influence of Marxist history is quite strong on progressives and on the main line to push them in that direction on lots of you know, normal topics of class and race and labor because the literature is heavily influenced by that stuff. But Marxists, like classical liberals, I think, in academia are actually on the outside. You know, so I have some sympathy. I have some, I have some Marxist friends who can't get jobs in academia. And, uh, you know, it's difficult. They're, they're not doing what the, in, in what the classical liberal approach is also to say is that these other positions should have a hearing. You know, we should have multiple perspectives. Yeah, I was shocked in graduate school to hear my fellow grad students saying, oh, can you believe it? He's a Marxist. Isn't that ridiculous? And I thought, wait, whoa, wait. What academia am I into here? This is strange where the students are criticizing the professors for being Marxist. Where were you? Weird. Pittsburgh? Yeah. I, I thought they were Marxists there. <laughs> there are. There are a couple. But uh, yeah, they were seen as the, the weird old cranks sort of who, uh, you know, had a lot of books out, important books. But, but, but this, is an, this is an important message in the book is we try to reach out in the introduction to progressives and conservatives and others to say that the classical liberal tradition is your tradition, that you relate to these, um, these types of ideas and that, um, you know, um, there's, there's something to be gained. Now, Phil, I know you, you dig into a lot of uh, statistics about uh, contemporary academia. Do we have any idea whatsoever how many classical liberal historians there are out there or how many libertarians with PhDs in history? Yeah, there, there are uh, no surveys that have any absolute number. 
I would put the total number of liberty friendly ish PhDs that are operating in some sort of an academic or quasi academic role, you know, probably in a couple hundred. Uh, and of that uh, core participants that uh, are, um, you, know, you know, on a day to day basis contributing to the tradition, I mean, we're talking a couple dozen. Well, so it's, a, it's a very small segment. It depends uh, here too, Phil, if we're limiting this to the United States only or to the world. I mean, both both of them are quite small numbers. I mean, I'm only aware of in the countries that I know things about only a handful in the Netherlands, only a handful in Germany. Um, nobody keeps track of this stuff. Um, and and I, I do, you know, want to make the distinction as well that I, I think classical liberal history as – you know, as I say again, we're defining for the first time uh, as a specific thing, as a specific concept. You know, define or be defined. Um, it's something bigger than libertarian history, right? Where libertarians can see themselves in that tradition, but I'd really want to draw on that 19th century legacy and and say, you know, what we need to continue doing today. We can draw these parallels between what they were doing then, people in the 20th century, and people today, and say that really it's a lot of the main line that's merely been forgotten. In fact, classical liberal history is really almost so successful that it didn't get labeled because it was so mainstream. And it's, I think I would say it's been pushed aside by progressive history in the last um, 50 years, 80 years, something like that. What do you think there is to gain then by marketing the idea of classical liberal history to departments or professional groups who are distinctly hostile to it? Well, first of all, I mean, you guys have probably had this experience. You go to grad school and you take a course in methods or approaches and week after week you're introduced to a new approach or a new method and it's Marxist history, a null school history, postmodernist history, et cetera, et cetera. Never once are you told that there's such a thing as conservative history or Christian history, right? Nobody writes that anymore. That's not even like a legitimate field or idea or even classical liberal or libertarian history. And so on my side, I'm reading these other arguments and I'm wondering when are these ever going to come into the classroom? Nobody's even heard of them before that there's alternative explanations. And so my goal is if you're going to be listing 10 approaches or 10 schools of thought in approaching the past, maybe one of them in that mix should be the classical liberals who have some different ideas and, and, and uh, interpretations. Phil, do you think that there are I mean, if you know, I'm assuming you agree with Michael's earlier point that uh, at one point all history was basically classical liberal history, um, and then today, do you see any bits of classical liberal history still existing and in informing other schools within the profession? You see, uh, anywhere that uh, methodological empiricism is at the core of a contribution, and uh, you know, again, it's not something that we have survey data on, but uh, I'd say there's a sizable minority of the field that still clings methodologically to rigorous, close reading of uh, historical evidence. These are the people that hit the archives and hit them hard uh, to just aggressively try and tease out and discern what was happening from the records that the past has left us. I think that is a uh, an approach that uh, is very much synchronous with this kind of 18th, 19th century uh, broader grouping that we would now maybe refer to as classical liberal history. Uh, the flip side of that is uh, you have other traditions that uh, have moved very far away from uh, empiricism in the way that they approach uh, historical topics. This is the same thing Michael was talking about, of people that kind of put the, uh, the theory cart before the horse of uh, the actual evidence. And uh, some of the fruits of that we see are historical claims that are often built upon a secondary or tertiary literature around a topic that have never really bothered to go back and look and see if the actual historical documents underlying that topic say what uh, subsequent interpretations of them have said. Uh, and I think this is where one of the dangers emerge is you start getting history that, uh, that settles in around a consensus myth and then builds upon that myth in even further and further directions uh, when uh, it's unchained from any kind of evidentiary base. Postmodernists are not Marxists because they're not structuralists. They don't think that history has to progress in a particular way. They do clearly identify, uh, as one of my professors like to say, who did what to whom. That's the point of studying history, to find out who did what to whom. And postmodernists have a real keen eye on that, I think. Um, 
How does their approach – well, could, could one of you define postmodernism and then perhaps the other one tell us? Well, I think uh, it, uh, it defies <laughs> definition on, on – Okay. Well, go ahead. Start, start there. Well, so you asked me before if it's a research approach or paradigm. And I'm not sure it is. I think it's almost like an anti-research paradigm. You know, they're seeking out forms of power. They're challenging the knowledge that we have, challenging the sources in our way of interpreting things. And so I, I'm actually quite influenced by postmodern uh, history. And I think probably a lot of people are today, just like Marxism. It comes into the main line. It gives us something. And so to me, the first great change in the professionalization of history was these guys like Niebuhr and von Ranke in the beginning of the 19th century who say we have to challenge interpretations by going to the sources. So source criticism is the first big change. But the second real big change in history, in my eyes, happens in the 1970s, first with this Lewis Mink, uh, who sort of is a bridge into postmodern history, and then Hayden White. And what they're doing is challenging our personal relationship with the sources to say, what are our priors that we're bringing to this? What are the sources of power that are influencing what gets collected in archives and the interpretations that are made over time? And so they make us skeptics. They challenge the whole historical narrative and the idea that we can even work from those sources to derive interpretations because our interpretations are always going to be biased and influenced by race, class, gender, and other types of things. And this is a fantastic challenge to the field that they have to take up. Now, the thing is, most historians ignore this and they say, well, yeah, of course, we have to listen to it. It's just like psychologists. It's like, yeah, we got to listen to Thomas Saz, but we don't believe him, right? And then, and then they come back into the fold and do their own thing, which is interpret the sources and write narrative history. Because, you know, we can't sit around and just constantly be skeptical and question our own assumptions. Sometimes we want to just put things down and, and, and tell the story one way or another. And so um, they'll tell stories that go against the grain, and these are an important part of it. Um, of course, postmodern uh, history is really powerful yet in the philosophy of history, very small f subfield of history, which is maybe dominated by the postmodernists, actually. Mm -hmm. Phil, could you tell us what critical theory is? Right, and maybe right. could so this could is a you find area. it? Could you find it uh, within yourself to say something nice about critical theory? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll say something nice in the, I guess, in the most general sense, uh, real similar to what Michael's noting with um, uh, the postmodernists. Critical theorists do tend to at least bring an outside perspective, an alternative perspective, uh, to bear there. Um, critical theory is really hard to define in itself, and it often eschews definition. Uh, if you go to some of the main uh, scholars that work in this tradition, uh, they're almost uh, schismatic in between themselves over uh, what they're, uh, how they'd even classify themselves. There's a, a narrow subset of critical theory that comes out of uh, the philosophy departments of mainly continental Europe, uh, so the Frankfurt School, um, Habermas is the, uh, the, the most uh, prominent kind of living active figure out of that tradition. Then there's a, a, a broader uh, diffusion of what we call critical theory methodologies to um, other fields, to other um, areas of the academy. And I tend to use the, the, the term more so in the broader sense. Uh, it is something that uh, came into vogue in the philosophy discipline first, uh, emerging ma mainly in the, uh, the 1960s and 70s. But philosophy, by and large, has moved beyond it, discarded out elements of it, or, or kind of cornered it to uh, uh, niche subsets of the academy. But from that point, it moved very heavily over into the humanities as a dominant tradition of, uh, of how to uh, approach evidence or the lack of evidence. Um, again, you get elements of trying to reduce everything to power relationships or group identities. So race, class, gender are uh, uh, the, the three main of the triumvirate of, uh, of analytical tools for, uh, for studying past events. Um, I could offer my own critique of it. So um, I, I am fairly harsh on critical theory approaches to history in the sense that I think they import a, um, a heavy amount of ideological baggage. Uh, so like what Michael was saying, you know, we, we can question our epistemic root of understanding uh, what exists in the archives. Uh, we can step back and say, OK, well, certain things are preserved and other things are not preserved for a very specific reason. This does have epistemic effects on what we can interpret out of it. Uh, my question, and this is where I, I diverge the, the sharpest from the critical theory crowd, 
is what do they offer in return. So it's kind of blowing up the evidentiary base of what we could find in archival material and then importing ideology, strong political ideology that's just taken as um, almost uh, assertions by declamation of historical truth that class is the means of analyzing this or that gender is the means of analyzing this. And then you start working backwards from that, uh, that declamation through the evidence. Uh, I think the problem that emerges here is when you uh, declaim a grand truth about something, you also alter the way you look at evidence around that supposed subject and the truth. You start seeking things that affirm that, uh, uh, that grand narrative, the ideology that uh, emerges there, uh, while also discarding or overlooking or neglecting other types of evidence that don't really quite fit to the narrative. Well, we, we've talked about class, and you brought up uh, race, gender, religion. Um, <clears throat> one of the strong claims made in this book, and one of the most interesting things that I read in it, um, is Jonathan Bean's claim that his book, Race and Liberty in America, is the first presentation of a liberal theory of race in its history. But now, given that you're saying classical liberal history is all about historicism, putting putting things in context, um, and empiricism, why has it taken so long for historians, liberal historians, to write a history of race in America? Yeah. Well, I think it is an oversight uh, of the discipline, It's a, and it's an oversight of our own subset of the discipline. One thing I would note as a caveat there, uh, a lot of racial history is very recent history. Uh, so simply the time that it takes to start uh, studying sources. I mean, the civil rights era occurred in the lifetime of many people that are still living. Uh, so you do have a little bit of that time lag and you have a very small subset of historians that are even working in this tradition. Uh, it's just a matter of, uh, of numbers, basically. Uh, one thing I would differentiate, I think, so, so Jonathan is writing very specifically about how do we analyze race as a historical topic, as a historical event, and certain events that, that took place in, uh, in American history in particular that have profound racial impacts. Well, uh, we can kind of separate that somewhat from classical liberal tr uh, contributions to racial history as they played out. Uh, and there, if we go back a uh, hundred years, we see some of the major actors in the uh, the formation of the NAACP, for example, uh, that I like to give uh, as a, um, a historical event. You have uh, what would have been considered the libertarians or classical liberals of the day uh, are some of the major actors there. So there's uh, Moorfield Story, who's uh, one of the attorneys that co-founds the NAACP uh, in the 1910s, he's a, um, a former clerk of the abolitionist senator, uh, Charles Sumner, uh, grew up in an abolitionist and free market, free trade, almost laissez-faire, classical liberal um, intellectual tradition. Uh, he's one of the main contributors that jumps in and tries to carry some of those ideas over on a, on a uh, civil rights front uh, with the founding of the NAACP. He's co-joined by uh, a journalist by the name of Oswald Garrison Villard, uh, who's uh, William Lloyd Garrison's grandson, uh, very much out of the same tradition, uh, classical liberal, intellectually, economically, uh, and then as well as a, a, a tradition of rights. Uh, so if you go back far enough, you start looking at some of the early histories of the civil rights movement. Uh, it, it's not so much a libertarian history of race or theory of race. It's rather classical liberals applying uh, principles of, of uh, rights to uh, uh, the institutions they see around them and, and using that individual uh, methodology to rectify injustices that they saw. So uh, in that sense, I see a history of, of race as it relates to classical liberal thought uh, just right and waiting to be written. Uh, and this includes carrying uh, some of those traditions all the way forward from the civil rights era to today. It also includes connecting the old school abolitionist and post-abolitionist uh, classical liberals to the mid 20th century. Uh, so just a project I'm taking up myself uh, very recently, I'm looking into a journalist by the name of R.C. Hoyles, who was the editor of the uh, Orange County Register for most of the mid 20th century. And uh, he's a very interesting guy. He's a uh, a radical anti-statist in some respects, uh, very much a free market uh, type of a character. But his uh, most prominent journalistic contributions 
He's one of the only newspapers in the United States that openly opposes Japanese internment during World War II. Uh, like he editorializes very aggressively against uh, not only FDR, but the governor of California who was complicit in carrying this out, Earl Warren, and comes to distinction uh, as one of the only major papers that's actually taking that editorial stance during the war. And then right after the war, he turns to desegregation. There's actually a test case that comes out of Santa Ana, California in 1947. That's, uh, uh, so it's a half decade before Brown versus Board, but they were testing a uh, de facto segregationist policy that separated Mexican-American students from white students in the local school district. And Hoyles uh, jumps in on the editorial uh, side of this, uh, lambasting the local school board for enacting segregation. Uh, so you have people that are drawing upon the classical liberal tradition. These are just a few examples of them to uh, to make arguments that have direct pertinence to civil rights, direct pertinence to racial history as it's unfolding. Uh, the question now is uh, uh, to, to jump into the sources. We need historians to, uh, to actually dig around in the, these issues um, in ways that treat them very similarly as we would treat something like uh, the history of uh, American capitalism or the history of free markets, which has received much more attention. Um, well, my only uh, – so I'm no expert on this topic. So I'm – when Jonathan Bean says that he's the first to present a liberal theory of race, I have to take him at his word because he's done the work on this. Um, but it seems to me that history of race in the 20th century has always been written in the service of something. So whether this is you know for the KKK or for some other conservative cause or for civil rights or, or, or something else, it wasn't something that classical liberals or libertarians took up as one of their main causes um, to, to talk about race uh, on the whole, right? There's specific examples, you know, during the civil rights movement, there's definitely civil libertarians who are making arguments and, and working on the ground, but it's not, it's not a topic um, that, um, well, f first of all, you have a lot of these like intellectual historians, the, the historians of ideas that started to fade in the 1960s. That was on the way out. And so uh, we lost that, that older generation when, idea, when history was ideas and politics and we moved into um, social class-based explanations. So there weren't classical liberals around or interested enough in those topics to write general theories of, of race and history as far as I know. Well, I really liked uh, David Beto's chapter in here too and um, he makes the case that at least part of the, the serious value of doing classical liberal history is that it, it illustrates very clearly the roads not taken in, uh, over time. Um, that the world is the way it is because particular people made very specific choices uh, during their lifetimes and so the world developed according to the choices they made. Uh, but they could very well have made different choices and uh, produced different results. So for our last question here, let me start uh, with you, Mike, and then we'll go to Phil. What are some of the most fruitful and interesting roads not taken uh, out there to be studied in history? and that can teach us uh, about where we should go in the future? Well, it's a great question, Anthony. And what I've been thinking the last couple of years is that historians need to investigate their own discipline more, that um, we don't study historiography as a, as a concept. We, we read history and then say that we know historiography, but we don't really think about what historiography is. We don't read theory. We don't have courses in the philosophy of history. We don't have courses in, in writing history as far as I know mostly. All these kinds of things that are like practical everyday things that historians in the real world do, we don't have those. We just have lots of content-based courses in grad school. So I'd like to see a, a transition towards the practicing historians that learn to argue like philosophers that are open and will get in a room and challenge and argue things out. And I was going to say this earlier. Historians of every stripe don't like to hear it when you listen to a different interpretation than your own, right? But I think more than anybody else, the libertarians get really upset when they hear other interpretations. And it's usually because their interpretation is not even listened to in that discussion. So you go to a major conference or you listen to C-SPAN or you listen to the news and they talk about history of tariffs or something and they get it all wrong. 
most people are like, okay, they got it wrong. But libertarians actually get like really mad about this <laughs> because it's like they're not being listened to. It's like we've written these, these works on this, but because it's not in the textbook and it's not like the obvious answer that's the, the, you know, the, the Occam's razor explanation of history that um, everybody accepts, it's, it's not listened to. So I, I think thinking about our own discipline is an important thing that historians need to do. And that's one of the contributions um, we've tried to make here. I would say also in general, just starting to, to understand more about agency of, of individual people, of small groups. I think we need more cultural anthropology and folklore in, in history, um, not just sort of the social class, race, gender explanations, but some more of the, the deeply like embedded cultural explanations that we can get from the, the cultural anthropologists and the folklorists. Yeah, yeah. I guess I'll pick up on a little bit of that theme. Uh, yeah, I, I certainly uh, will admit to being one of those historians that does get mad when I hear um, other interpretations, not so much uh, with disagreement with the interpretation, but uh, just the presentation of material, factual material uh, that's in error. It's wrong. Um, this comes up to the forefront oftentimes when historians who are not trained in economics uh, attempt to talk about economic issues. Uh, this is a part that uh, I got into in my contribution to the book. My chapter addressed some of the uh, what's called the new history of capitalism school. And this is a, uh, a movement that's kind of emerged in the history profession, mostly in the wake of the uh, financial crisis, 2007, 2008. This is a relatively new birth of material uh, that purports to be studying economic history and economic events, uh, which I think is actually a, a positive development to some extent, and the fact that, hey, historians are paying attention uh, to something outside of the race, class, gender triumvirate. Uh, they're starting to, to, to notice uh, that economic matters do intrude into uh, historical discussions. But uh, at the same time, it's something that's been picked up without the toolboxes that are often necessary to discuss complex events. So something like a tariff. Uh, if you read an average tariff history of the 19th century, um, I mean, it's almost like stumbling into the president's Twitter feed. Uh, that, that's the level of economic knowledge that's, uh, that's brought to bear to these discussions. Uh, it's uh, another example that I cite in the, in the chapter. There was a, um, a famous contributor to this new history of capitalism approach. He was trying to measure the impact of slavery on the national economy of the United States and therefore attempted to, or purported to do a, um, a calculation of how much slavery contributed to the U.S. Uh, GDP in, say, like 1840. And he goes through what's essentially just a made-up formula that's not even rooted in any of the standards and practices of the field and comes up with some ridiculous number where, like, basically half the United States economy is uh, derived from slavery. Uh, but the way he obtains this is through uh, double counting, triple counting, separate and apart from... Uh, the conventions that economics would bring to bear in measuring national accounts. Uh, so I do see this kind of a, a, a separation in the discussion of economic uh, ideas and the actual tools that are often necessary as kind of a, a foundation to take up those ideas. Um, so I see that as a missed opportunity uh, that goes back uh, the better part of a century, the fact that economists were not talking to historians and vice versa, historians were not consulting economists, uh, has really kind of left us in this mire where you have two separate trajectories uh, that are discussing the same history, the same events. Classic example I give is if you look at a, a standard U.S. history textbook or even uh, uh, more scholarly works on U.S. history and ask the question, what caused the Great Depression? Well, a historian will often uh, offer something that uh, economists sometimes refer to as underconsumption theory plus inequality come together in the late 1920s and then boom, start stock market crash. FDR steps in and fixes it. Uh, if you ask any economic historian who uh, actually studies things like business cycles, studies uh, the complex mechanisms of what initiates or triggers and uh, a recession or a depression, uh, studies the major camps and theories about uh, economic recovery. And, and I don't care if you're an Austrian, a Keynesian, uh, a monetarist, neoclassical type, uh, these are rigorous theories, but they're all but absent from uh, uh, conventional historical accounts. 
so a historian, average historian, would probably tout uh, the victory of FDR in ending the Great Depression. Uh, an economist would look at this and say, we have substantial economic evidence, substantial empirical evidence that FDR's policies in some extent, uh, prolonged and exacerbated the Great Depression. So completely opposite conclusions reached by historical experts using different methodologies on the exact same topic, and neither of them are talking to each other. Uh, I see that as uh, a missed opportunity and something that I hope we can move closer toward rectifying. A huge thanks to Professors Dalma and Magnus for joining us this week. And since I made them do it, let me give it a shot. What is classical liberal history? It is a centuries-long tradition in academic and popular history, stressing that individuals are the sole units of human agency, and any stories about the human experience over time must necessarily be built, as it were, from the bottom up, with reference to individual experience, motivations, and decisions. Classical liberal history is the only truly humane method of writing about the past. Though, as always, there is much we can learn from our academic opponents. Liberty Chronicles is a project of libertarianism.org. It is produced by Tess Terrible. If you've enjoyed this episode of Liberty Chronicles, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. For more information on Liberty Chronicles, visit libertarianism.org.